This interview was conducted at the 2015 Nonfiction Now Conference in Flagstaff, Arizona. I, I want to ask you about the title. So mm -hmm. the idea of the Argo, that its parts may be replaced over time, but the boat is still called the Argo. Yeah. I'm wondering um, at what point in the process of writing this uh, you came across this idea, or did you have it already? Like, uh, when did the title start to emerge itself? Or well, you know, the title, it didn't really, um, I kind of said last night that, that the, you know, the book Roland Barthes by Roland Barthes, which is a book that I read a lot while writing this, you know, and I, and I love Roland Barthes, read a lot of him, um, it's a concept, I mean, I'd read those descriptions about the Argo many times over the past, you know, 20 years, so it wasn't a, um, it wasn't something I discovered while writing through, you know, and that, and that pat and um, the, I think the title was post, um, I mean, this book had a lot of titles along the way, <laughs> um, and I can tell because on my computer it's referred to, you know, there are many files underneath a different title, you know, <laughs> and, um, and I think that, you know, when I wasn't happy with any of the working titles I had, you know, I've, often I'll do this where I reread my book, you know, looking for a title within its pages that seems like, uh, you know, it would work, and I think that this one seemed, I mean, you always run the risk of like, which has indeed happened, and that's totally fine, but of kind of making it, you know, you're really underscoring one particular thematic in it, you know, but what I liked about this title was that, I mean, A, it was kind of catchy, but B, it was, um, it it named, you know, it was the name of people <laughs> with a plural, so it was like a tribe, you know, kind of a thing. But where it, whereas it also referred to a kind of foundational metaphor in the book, so I like those parts of it. Yeah, and yeah. it was a it was a lot better. Than, I won't I won't go into what the other ones were. <laughs> it was a lot better than those. So yeah. that's great. Um, well, and you talked about the quotations, like the embedded quotations a little bit last night in your keynote. Um, but I'm curious if, if this research was stuff that you were planning on for a memoir, mm -hmm. if you were reading all of, uh, all of these authors mm -hmm. in an intention to put something together, or um, was it something that as you were writing, you were thinking, oh, this very much reminds me of this. You know, all my all my books, for the most part, except for like at a certain kind of halfway through point where it, where I feel like I end up really focusing, like when you kind of know it's a book and stuff like that. But I feel like my reading and research is just um, you know it's just like a river flowing beside me in life, you know. And especially this book because a lot of the books I'm talking about and theorists are some people that you know I started reading in the early '90s, you know. So they're 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 a long time. Coming, I think that so there was no really focused. Here's these things I'm researching for this book, you know, mm -hmm. because I think this book in particular is also a dramatization of how you know daily everyday life and things that might be coming up for you are related to ideas that you read about, you know. So there was a very natural weave. I mean, there may be some, there might have been some ideas in the book, and some of the maybe maybe like five or six pieces, you know that I'm quoting that I explicitly sought out. I mean, at a certain point you get like, you focus and you are like, I need to read more about sodomitical maternity or I need to read more about, you know, you, you just focus on particular spheres, but it's not, it wasn't a, um, there was no there there of like a book I was researching. Right. You know, <laughs> it just didn't, you know, I mean, sometimes like, uh, that's never happened to me, I don't think, in life. You know, I feel like this sub a subject chooses you chooses me probably based out of reading and life both and then eventually if there are gaps or leads that seem hot like trails that seem like you want to follow with it then then, then you research those you know yeah but I feel like I never maybe I, mean, I don't think anybody does this but I feel like sometimes there's this idea like there's all these waiting books or topics that you kind of like pick one out of the sky and research it, you know what I mean? Like as if like your teacher gave you like a list of like here are ten books you could write a book report on, you know? <laughs> like and and it just is so much more um, organic, I think, as a process for me. Yeah. Um. So 
I read a review of the Argonauts in N plus one, mm -hmm. and uh, it was very well written. Um, but Moira Donigan, who yeah. wrote the review, she says um, the Argonauts is a project about queer family making twice over, literally as it tells the story of Nelson, Harry, and their children, and literarily in its composition, mm -hmm. in that everyone that you quote, mm -hmm. that you quoted and embedded into your book mm -hmm. kind of creates some sort mm -hmm. of familial mm -hmm. enterprise, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about like if you feel similarly while you're writing it, if, it, if you are creating a literary family. Yeah, I mean that comment I think is very astute in that it was kind of the the kind of guiding principle of the book is that like I, I, I've never really liked the word family and before this book or enterprise it was not one that I ever really would use even even in the sense of queer family which a lot of people you know a lot of queers use the word family really loosely as a means of like recognizing each other you know um, but it was not like my word you know so I think it's like I'm kind of like I'm lessening the bristle around it, but I think that the one way that I could write about something that you could call kind of, you know, a literal family making in a reproductive logic or in an adoption logic or whatever, um, you know, to me could only be done if paired with showing a d different forms of kinship that seem as interesting, <laughs> you know, to me. And in this case, that's, you know, kind of showing your hand at the intellectual family that you feel yourself a part of or aspire to be a part of and and, um, and that was the whole I mean I think of a book often I mean it depends on the book but most of my books of nonfiction feel like parties to me where the people who I've where I'm inviting certain players you know like at a round table you know to play and the cast of characters is it, it, it has it has there's similarities from book to book but different main characters, you know, at the table, but that's part of the fun to me, is, is bringing all these different people together. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, in the second half of the Argonauts, there's a moment where you say, quote, I don't want to represent anything. At the same time, every word that I write could be read as some kind of defense or assertion of value of whatever it is that I am, whatever viewpoint it is that I ostensibly have to offer whatever I've lived. That's the horror of speaking, of writing. There's nowhere to hide. Um, since the release of this book, have you noticed any kind of having been categorized as like the writer who talks about this <laughs> and is a representative in some way and what's problematic about that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm kind of a hard writer to do that with because if you don't know my other books, you might read this book and say that, but it would be pretty hard to, um, I mean, I think that it's part of my personality structure that whenever I do one thing, like even as I'm doing it, there's a part of me that's like slithering out of it, wanting to do the next thing and that totally doesn't <laughs> resemble, you know, the thing I was just doing. I mean, I talk about that a little bit in here, of like my totem animal being a an otter or whatever, like trying to skip away. So I think that, um, you know, and I mentioned it last night, like, was it last night? No, I was at the panel where I was talking about when someone once said to me, like, I don't get it, your book on the color blue, I thought you were obsessed with the sexual murder of your aunt, you know, like, as, as if, like, you know, you couldn't, like, perform different obsessions in different books, you know, so I think that I like to it's fine with me if the books, per, like, I think they're meant to perform an obsession or a way of thinking about a particular topic, um, but I think that, I mean, in that same review that you're talking about from M plus one, I think she said something like, it's hard to imagine how she could ever write another book again, as it seems like the culmination of whatever, and, it, and that seemed very, like, humorous to me, only in that, like, I like this book, <laughs> I think it's a good book, but it doesn't feel, um, it does feel cumulative of thinking about these issues at this moment in time, but it's like not, there's so many other things that I have on my mind. <laughs> right. You know? And gender and sexuality is like a through line, um, family making or care, or interdependence, things this book is about. They're, they're, they're through lines that have appear, that appear through all my books, but, um, but the particular kind of autobiographical theoretical exercise of this was just a moment. I mean, I think it was an interesting spring because of the marriage decision from the Supreme Court and because of 
a lot of trans visibility campaigns, so I feel like, um, you know, which explains in part some of the interest in the book, which is, you know, a good thing in so far as it means that your writing is coinciding with something that's timely on people's minds, but I think that the Argonauts, as it were, not the book, but the tribe, you know, it's like, you know, people have been thinking about these things for a really long time, so it's kind of an accident if the culture, you know, if the mainstream culture, like, suddenly is like, let's do a trans visibility campaign, but, you know, it's not like that didn't invent, you know, the existence or history of non-normatively gendered people, <laughs> you know right. what I mean? So I think in that way there's something a little bit, um, you know, there's always something a little bit quizzical about something being timely, you know. Um, but I don't, I mean, I think I've made it really clear both in the book and in interviews that, um, I mean, that I don't want this to sound too pretentious, but I do think that the role of an intellectual thinking out loud is typically to provide nuance, um, not sound bites. So I think if anyone came to me this spring or later looking for a kind of spokesperson, um, for things that could be uh, reduced in a way that the you know mainstream media likes, and then the book would only disappoint. However, I think for a lot of people who were suffering a little bit this past season with feeling uncomfortable with the reduction of some very complex issues in the media, I've heard from a lot of them, uh, which is great that they are so glad that the book this book came out at the same time because it felt like a richer representation of some complicated issues that were in danger of being um, uh, misunderstood and compacted in ways that felt um, anywhere from disgruntling to violent, you know, right. if that makes sense. Right. So at one point in The Argonauts you write that um, that's why we, you and Harry, both hate uh, that's what we both hate about fiction, or at least crappy fiction. It purports to provide occasions for thinking through complex issues, but really it has predetermined the positions. Um, I mean, this might be a simple answer, but it, in what ways does nonfiction avoid mm -hmm. this imposition? And I'm sure that it does. I mean, that was a, you know, like I've said in a different interview, that's like ended up like so many people have asked me about that, like fiction writers especially, you know. And, I don't know. It's a, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. You know, I don't think I don't think it does because I think basically the creation of any work, you're not going to be able to get out of the fact that you are constructing. You're constructing a world, you know, with either ors or with choices or with different, you know, you're. Um, but I think that, and there's certainly a lot of fiction. You know, the great kind of moral nuancers of like George Eliot or Henry James or like will come to mind who like do not create worlds that create, you know, a binary of choice, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. of choices. But I think that there is this sense that, um, uh, you know, the, the nonfiction and the fiction that I like the most leave spaces within the universe it's creating instead of making you feel like the X-Men. <laughs> like that things are boiling down to a choice and it makes you forget. You know, part of why I hate like kind of coffee clutch style like post theater, like what did you think of the play? Like, you know, kind of conversation is that so often um, the premises that were presented to you as the you know by the by the theatrical world or the you know the fictive world that you just imbibed, you know that the that the I guess this is what's a little bit different about fiction is that the seduction of the fiction, the suspension of disbelief that you entered to go into it, um, made you in part. Um, I mean, this is kind of Brechtian. Like without your knowledge, you kind of imbibed the rules that it was laying out to you about its world, and so I think that you know, work that, uh, I, so when you enter into those, you know, conversations about, you know, do you think, you know, he was morally right to have, you know, done this or that in a play or whatever, like that you're, you're you often, um, you know, no one's stepping back and saying like, a playwright constructed this 
play and, and made these issues and these people acted them out. You know what I mean? Right. Like just kind of getting that this is the directing part, but you know, like that distance from the production at hand. So I think it probably has something to do with you know the seductiveness of fictive universes. You know, which is um, and in nonfiction, you know, I think that. Uh, you know, people often worry about when they write nonfiction, like painting other people in a negative light or something. But I think one thing that I've noticed a lot with my students and other writing is that, you know, often the more negative you paint somebody, the reader has a, they know it's a real person and they have a kind of natural sympathy, which is excited that makes you think, wow, I wonder what the mother thought about this. Like, you know, like I, now I'm hearing what the child thought, but you know, you know, what was going on for her? You know, like it's very rare that somebody says, I bet this writer got it exactly right and that person was really an asshole. You know what I mean? So I think it's like that because you have a real world that people can meditate and wonder about, like you, there's something about the nonfiction where you, you naturally know that the world you have created um, in the book, that the that the actual thing, you know, way exceeds what the writer, you know what I mean, like mm -hmm. what the writer um, had in there, and so I tend to like things that not only, I mean, that might be a natural effect of nonfiction, but I like to, um, I like work that that somehow implicitly or explicitly reminds you of that space, if that, if that makes sense. You know? Yeah. Or at least acknowledges the space existing. Yeah, the... Anna, what do you think? Do you think nonfiction does anything? Uh, I think not all nonfiction. Mm -hmm. I think that yeah. no, some nonfiction can go the same yeah. way as fiction. But I think, again, like you said about yeah. it being true and this this idea that it is a normal world and you do have to think about or people often feel compelled to think about yeah. someone else's perspective in it just yeah. because it's not made up. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Though I think some nonfiction might yeah. try to guide you into certain yeah. directions. I mean it's you know, it's a specious comment in its way in the book. Um, because as we're deciding here, some nonfiction makes universes that, that are more porous than others, and some fiction makes you know things that are more porous than others too. So, and, and a lot of it's not, you know, not to sound too much like the but you know, sometimes it just comes down to like, you know, good or bad or mediocre writing, you know, because I think the very, I think, I think that. You can try and make all the space you want in your fiction or nonfiction, but there's a quality, there's a quality about doing it that, um, that, that, like a lot of people set out with the intent of like, oh, I'm gonna leave a lot of gaps and holes so you can imagine what people are thinking, but it's just not rendered well. It's just not done. It's just not, you know, like so. It's a very, um, you know, uh, evanescent quality of what makes something. Uh, work in that porous fashion and what makes it feel closed down, you know, which has probably a lot to do with talent and also the writer's uh, um, capacities for, you know, like where they're at, you know, right. just as a person, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, which is something that is very difficult. I find when I'm writing, which is like this ongoing question of like, can you write yourself into more knowledge, understanding, insight than you actually have, you know? Like, can writing deliver those things unto you, or is it, you know, kind of chicken egg thing? Like, you need to have them before, you know, or else the right. You know what I mean? And I, I mean, I think that's why I really like nonfiction writing and autobiographical writing is that that chicken egg question. Um, it, you know, in terms of like how a self. Uh, gets made or moves or is constructed is always really an issue for me. Like I'm always very interested in like if my writing has changed. Like if I'm you sit down to write for the day and you end up somewhere a little bit different and you and don't really know did something happen to me? You know, like I just think this question's really interesting. You know? Yeah. Um did I really did I write through my rage or is it still there? Or you know what I mean? Like and I, but I do think actually like I said in my book Blue Woods that writing doesn't change anything and um but I feel like it's really only in retrospect that you can see how a book might have changed oneself or one's thinking, you know, and that's very interesting to me. 
Do you think anything about the Argonauts changed, <laughs> <laughs> changed your perspective? I mean, this is a kind of a boring thing to say, because I've said it before, but I think some people have taken it when I've said that I like burn out a problem as if I'm like giving up and it's like a kind of uh, easy way out, like as if it's like a shrug to say that like when I write a book I burn out a problem instead of solve it, you know? But I do feel like um, that burning through a problem, it's not an easy way out. Like I do think it does something like the questions because if you burn out the problem, say, in this book of, like, of things that were bothering me about normativity and, and queerness or, like, certain things like that, like, it, it, something did happen because I burned it out such that you find a new doorway that interests you to walk through, you know what I mean? So you just, you're not, um, you didn't solve the problem, but you, you thought it through enough that it didn't need to be thought anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, which I think makes space, which I guess is a big thing for me, is just keeping, um, keeping, finding new windows and doors to open, you know, in a room. So I think if there's something that makes you feel, I mean, this is very Wittgensteinian, who's probably my favorite philosopher, but you know, he talked a lot about philosophy, is just getting, showing the fly the way out of a fly bottle, you know, when it's been trapped, or he talked about being at, like, finding your way at the end of a cul-de-sac and, like, how to get out of a mental cul-de-sac, but I think there's something very, um, he was the one who said, who I was quoting in Lewis when he said, you know, philosophy doesn't change anything, it leaves everything as it is, and he was who I was quoting when I said writing doesn't change anything, it leaves everything as it is, but, um, but, if the fly's out of the fly bottle or you're out of that cul-de-sac, everything's not exactly as it was because something's been clarified <laughs> right, <laughs> right. for you, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. I like the, I like the fly analogy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> me too. Um, so there was, there was one part when you're talking about your writing process really briefly and you um, talk about, or I'll say, quote, my writing is riddled with such ticks of uncertainty. I have no excuse or solution, save to allow myself the tremblings, then go back later and slash them out. In this way, I edit myself into a boldness that is neither na uh, native or foreign to me. And I was interested in this idea of mm -hmm. like your revision process and mm -hmm. revising out this mm -hmm. uncertainty. And I was just wondering if you would elaborate on that process. I say this. It's like um, the reason why I love that Bart quote where he says, you know, writing itself is is assertive. You know, you can't hide out from the assertive properties of language. Is that um, there's some kind of writing that you can do where you say, I think this, but I could be wrong, or you know, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, like this kind of those kind of ticks of uncertainty, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when you first write them out it feels um, good because you feel like you're writing in a way that's not, um, that's making space, again, for like, for doubt or self-scrutiny or for, you know, possibilities of error or for just acknowledging that you don't have a totalizing view, right? Um, but I think that it's not a matter of shepherding yourself towards a totalizing view by slashing them out. What it is, is, is that when, when you slash them out, even if you say very bold things that you might not want to like stand behind in the morning or something like that, um, the writing itself is still, can still be like a performance with uncertainty woven into it because it's um, a performative gesture if you're following me. It's mm -hmm. not, you're not like, you know, chiseling something into stone that's going to be like a commandment, you know what I mean? You're, 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 you're doing, I mean, I think I get this a lot from poetry, which is, you know, a real kind of conviction that each, each scene of writing is a kind of scene of performance. Um, maybe from dance I get it too, but it's like a, um, you know, I think of it very much like in a dance sense, because I used to do a lot of improvisatory dance where you, you enter the space, like, and you see the moves that you kind of like, like you, you, that you might want to make in that space, you know, and, and then you go in and try and make them, and then um, I think that given that there's so much uncertainty in that process, it really, it may kind of matters if you say, I think this before you say, you know, 
you know, the thing, <laughs> or whether or not you just say the thing, but I don't know if it matters as much as, um, as we might be taught to think sometimes, you know what I mean? So I think I, I think I, uh, I think it could be academic, it could be female, it could be a lot of things, but I think uh, that, and it could be positive, like I, I value a kind of jittery thinking all the way around an issue kind mm -hmm. of a thing, but I also really love bombastic writing. I love Arto and I love Susan Sontag and I love, you know, people who are really, you know, the whole history of art boils down to two facts. You know, <laughs> like the moral history of the universe is what lies in the fact. You know, just is really because it's like, you know, like on a kind of undergraduate level, people often respond to this. I think this writer's so bossy. You know, like Gertrude Stein says, sugar's not a vegetable. Like, how does she know? You know, like <laughs> people get really reactive, but, but I think. Kind of part of growing up is realizing that you don't have to feel bossed around by somebody else's bombasticness that you can just hear it as like a mode of expression you know right. what i mean so i think that in my own writing i just kind of play often with these poles of of um i don't think i'm particularly bombastic but you know play with poles of, of strong assertion and a kind of jitteriness um which i think are just uh, but I do, you know, in editing, I think that uh, some people might write a lot of bombast first that they have to um, facet, and I think I tend more to myself to uh, write a lot of uh, just a lot of equivocating, and often I have to find the sentence and the heart of the paragraph of equivocations that was the one I wanted to write. So that's how, you know, so that's what I was describing there. Yeah. Yeah. So when I say a boldness that's neither native nor foreign to me, like, uh, you know, it's not native to me because equiv equivocation is equally native to me, but on the other hand, uh, I also feel like I'm known as someone who says what I think boldly, so it's kind of a, a weird mix, right. <laughs> you know, but one I think like with all structures as a writer that, you know, you, as the cliche goes, you know, you you get to know who you are and you make of those things, you know, your flaws and your virtues and you make of them a style, you know. Yeah. You know, it's not for everybody, I'm gathering. Yeah. And that's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's fine with me, you know what I mean? Like, right. I think in particular when I write, um, not so much with autobiography, but if I'm writing something that's more coded as cultural criticism, you know, people I've noted are just often hungrier for for pronouncements that seem um, uh, just to kind of like, well, what did you really think, you know, kind of a thing, and, right. and, and they're frustrated with, with, with statements that seem like they contradict each other or whatnot. You know, I, it's never, um, people talk about that a lot with Susan Sontag, and, you know, that, it, I mean, I really, I have such an appetite for contradiction that that has just never bothered me because I don't often go to writing for like a streamlined argument, you know? Like, right. I feel like you can, there are plenty of mainstream nonfiction books you can go to if you want to read that, you know? Yeah. But that's not really what I go for um, because contradiction seems to me often a very, like a lifeblood of, um, of thinking, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think that's something that works thematically throughout the whole book too. Right. This like, uh, I don't know if you would call it like comfort and ambiguity, but yeah. like some idea that we don't have to have the answer to yeah. everything or have an yeah. argument for it. So. I mean, I think it's, I mean, it's foundational too to questions about gender and people being very bedeviled by this notion of feminism of like, how can we deconstruct the category of woman in such a way that, you know, um, will have nothing to stand on, you know, the sands will be shifting forever, and um, and yet how can we also feel ourselves to be women in some sense, and you know, to me that just, um, I can see why for some it might cause a kind of cognitive dissonance that they find, you know, horrifying, but I like, I mean, and I quote Denise Riley, who I admire a lot, and you know, she says, you know, such are the shifting sands upon which feminism must sway, you know, like that is the situation, you know, of, of um, that the category of women must be always problematized and destabilized and we must, you know, like also, like, you know, you know, we don't need to like 
put the category in the nearest trash bin either, you know, and, and, and there's some, um, I think that a lot of the, I won't call them faux, I won't call them faux debates or fights because there are some real issues at hand, but a lot of the kind of me, media prominent debates that were being put forward this, you know, I mean, throughout time, but in the past year or so, uh, between, um, you know, kind of cisgendered feminists and trans women about the meaning of womanhood or the category of woman, you know, really um, seemed like if, if some of those shifting sands could be accepted <laughs> as a kind of a priori condition, then um, there might not need to be such, uh, again, kind of uh, horror at meeting a contradiction, <laughs> you know, when, when it's met in the field and then presuming people have to work at odds instead of finding a way to work together. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think that we have gone like into just about every okay, possible great. questions okay. I have, and I think okay. we're at a good time. Okay. Um, we have one traditional question that we okay. ask I everybody, okay. um, and we usually do it via email, yeah. but we just ask what your writing space looks like. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> What does my writing space look like? I have like a a poria, like a blind spot. Like I don't know where I write. Like I don't know where writing ever happens. Like there's no site like kind of specific because it's very diffuse between like my hotel room over here at the Drury Inn, you know, or whatever. But um, you know, if no one's home, I prefer to work at the kitchen table. <laughs> but if everyone's home, then I have a um, uh, a tough shed, which is like. Out of desperation, like you know, you can call like one eight hundred tough shit, and they'll come like deliver. You know these like um, uh, tool shed kind of things that I had, you know, drywall and stuff. So I have a tough shed in my backyard, and so if I can't work at the kitchen table, I work out there. But it's a nice space. I mean, it's small. It's eight by ten. But um, my old writing teacher, Amy Dillard, turned me on to the um, prefab cabin. Um, so all you need is a little bit of space to have one and a little bit of money to have it delivered. And yeah. then you two can have your own room of one's own. <laughs> and all of, it takes four hours to install. So. Oh my gosh. Oh, well, I know. I would, I would love to have something like that. I live with my fiancé uh -huh. and his twin six-year-old daughters. Oh, wow. And so wow. when no one's home, I... Right at the kitchen table, but right. otherwise I'm like hiding wherever I, I can. Know. Like, I know. Everyone's always kitchen. like, "You must love your office," and I'm like, "No, I like the, I mean, the kitchen table is proximity to tea, the bathroom, all right. my books." Because my my tough show doesn't have, you know, I only bring up there like the five books I need, but you know, I much prefer to be have my bookcases. But you know, the internet has made alas a lot of the bookcases not entirely necessary when you're looking for that passage you can't find miraculously there it is on Google Books you know so right and sometimes easier to find exactly although so my too. tough shit doesn't have good internet so which is a blessing and a curse yeah. right yeah. <laughs> well awesome thank you yeah, for thank sitting you. with me